All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Phys Ed Summit 4.0. We have uh, one hour gone, and, and uh, hopefully if you've been watching, you know that those previous uh, broadcasts will be uh, shown on the Phys Edagogy website. So if you missed one, don't worry. You can always check in a little bit later. So uh, we're happy that you could join us for getting started with Sport Ed with Ken Ford. He is our presenter today, and uh, I've had the preview of having some conversations with him beforehand, and y'all are in for a, a real treat. Uh, Ken <laughs> is presently uh, in Beijing, but he has taught all over the world, literally, and uh, a great perspective on teaching as well as the sport ed model. So if there are any technical issues, we will use the TOSL to uh, repost the link for YouTube. So uh, I hope that you are ready, and Ken, it is all you, buddy. Thanks, William. Appreciate the support. Uh, uh, thanks to everyone who's showing up. up. Um, um, I know I Nate's know. out there from BIS in Beijing as well, so it's good to know there's another Beijing hardcore PE teacher out there up at midnight doing the PD duty, so that's great to know. Uh, my presentation today is on the sport ed model and just sort of how I've introduced it into my teaching this year. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen and go through the presentation I have. Um, so if you've got any questions, just throw them out onto the tozzle and William's going to throw them back to me and we'll try to find some times to pause in between. If I just start rattling off too fast, please just ask William to start throwing <laughs> tweets at me so I can pay more attention to the speed I'm talking with or speed I'm talking at. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hope this works. And you got to share a screen now, William? Yeah, but it's got me on it. So, okay, there we go. There you go. So, we're going to start by looking at my, this as an introduction. And think of this very much as an overview of sport ed. The, what we're going to talk about is who I am super briefly, because that's going to bore you senseless. Uh, what is sport ed, sport ed or sport education in a real general sense? Um, I'll talk to you about my reasons for developing it into my teaching this year. Uh, how I've developed it to suit my context, and I'll give you some background in my context and the kids I teach as well. And then just some of the, it'll be an ongoing things that I've picked up doing this in a few units now. Um, and at the very end, I did a survey last week with uh, my students, and I'll just give you some of uh, sound bites and their general impressions of it. And then hopefully lots of time in between for Q and A. Uh, so, my name is Ken Ford. Uh, I'm currently teaching uh, at the Western Academy of Beijing. Website's there if you want to check it out. It is at a fantastic school with some pretty amazing facilities. So, I am a very spoiled physical educator who definitely can try out a lot of things other people don't have the facilities or equipment for. So, I'm very lucky that way. Uh, studied physical education at the University of Victoria. Super lucky to have studied under Dr. Tim Hopper, who's been referenced a ton already in Kellyanne Perry's um, as one of the TGFU gurus. And uh, another excellent uh, physical educator, Dr. Sandra Gibbons. So if you're ever interested in the theory side of it, those are two excellent people to sort of follow up on. Uh, I've been teaching for 11 years now. My wife and I moved overseas. This is my beautiful wife, Amanda. Uh, we've been teaching overseas for three, or sorry, for 11 years now. Uh, moved overseas to the UK for three years, taught in the state system there. Uh, moved to the UAE, uh, Ras al Khaimah, which is a community north of Dubai. Was there for four years, and we're about halfway through our fifth year in Beijing and absolutely loving it here. Uh, context. So you understand where I'm coming from when I talk about how I've introduced this program into my teaching. Uh, I only teach grade seven. Um, I teach grade seven physical and health education. I have a total of 112 students split over five homerooms. 
Uh, we are a very diverse school. In grade seven, we've got 22 nationalities. Out of those, 28% are require specific language support and 10% require specific learning support. So that might be uh, severe dyslexia or other learning difficulties. Um, working in an international school, there is a continuous challenge of language learning and making sure that all of your teaching is accessible to a range of language um, abilities. Uh, we work with the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program, IBMYP framework, uh, and we the curriculum we teach is uh, in-house developed standards and benchmarks uh, that was developed a couple of years before I arrived here. Uh, we get two 80-minute lessons a week on a rotating schedule, and I teach six units over the course of the year, and they're both both listed there, or they're all listed there. Uh, one of the great things about our school is we, one of our admissions, or our, our admissions policy is very much grounded in diversity, and we do, we try not to carry more than 20% of a given nationality in any grade level, so you get a really good perspective, uh, and it's really challenging trying to figure out what the kids actually know about different sports because in one class you may have an American kid who's never heard of rugby and a Kiwi kid who has trained in high level development programs. Uh, and the range of understanding of different sports is pretty phenomenal. If you've ever worked in an international setting, you figure that out pretty quick. So what is sport ed? Uh, Everything I'm talking about is originally based on a model outlined um, by Seedentop, Hasty, and Vandermars. There's a very good book uh, that's available on Amazon. Link is here. Um, you'll be able to get to that through the resources that William posted uh, on the Tozzle. From their model, the goal of sport education is to educate students to be players in the fullest sense and to help them develop competent, literate, and enthusiastic sports persons. Uh, if our goal is to educate students who are active, engaged, and enthusiastic participants throughout their lives, this model is a great way to support those aims by broadening students' experience with sport and activity to have a more rounded understanding of what success and participation can look like, rather than a very traditional model of you are successful, there, or you are talented, therefore you're rewarded by good grades. Uh, I approach this with the idea that a competent sports person develops sufficient skills to participate in a range of games and understands and can execute strategies. Literate in sport and activity, uh, they value the rules, rituals, and traditions of sport and other physical activities. They understand the etiquette and the inherent community that comes with sport. They identify positive and negative practices in sport and activities and can recognize when situations are unsupportive to their development or detrimental to healthy participation. Enthusiastic sports persons behave in a way that preserves, protects, and enhances their cult the sport culture. They want to participate because they value the experience. They become intrinsically motivated to want to be better, and they want to participate, not for the winning and not because someone's pressuring them, but because given the choice, it's what they would like to do. One of the most important attributes towards developing lifelong participants and healthy learners is the experience they can get in this model. At a really basic level, I approach sport ed in three ways. The seasons, the teams, and very specific roles and responsibilities. In a traditional sport ed model, the year is broken up into extended seasons. These might be 18 to 20 lessons long. I don't have that luxury. Our units are planned about a year ahead of time, and I decided to try this model after our units have been set for the year. So I'm working with uh, anywhere from four to six week long units, which give me eight to 12 lessons at a maximum. Uh, I worked really hard after our first unit to establish the teams. Um, you can divide them pretty much any way you want, but from my experience this year, really carefully considering the groups 
after you get to know them and placing them based on different strengths and different priorities is the way I will always go about organizing this in the future. The roles and responsibilities are ones are a part of this model that can get really overwhelming. In the full model from Seed and Top, there is a huge number of roles and responsibilities. And we're gonna take, I'll show you a comparison at the towards the end of the presentation. I decided to focus on some very narrow roles to make sure that all students were engaged in this as much as possible. So a brief outline of my experience so far with Sport Ed. I've been using aspects of it all the way back to when I started teaching in England. I've, it's always been an interest to me because I've always found it as a thought of it as a great way to get students engaged in a wider aspect of sport than just being participants and just being players. But for a variety of reasons, I've never been able to follow through on implementing it. I've used aspects of it in single units, but never built it into what could be considered an integral part of my teaching or of student learning. Uh, and that's what I've really worked on doing this year. In the UK, I used it uh, with the department in a track and field or athletics unit. Uh, and this was an attempt at the full seed and top model. And we used a ton of different roles and we had combined some groups to make some very large teams. And it wasn't very effective because we didn't plan very effectively for roles that weren't the coach. We didn't really give clear outlines or clear descriptions of responsibilities to the other students who were doing roles like equipment manager or uh, journalist or any of the other roles that are outlined in the seed and top model. It was a really superficial first attempt. We got lost in the details of the organization and we tried to do way too many things too quickly. We just didn't give it enough thought. We tried to fit a model to our kids rather than understanding what our kids would be best suited to and designing something that would work for them. In the UAE, I very quickly realized that this model would not suit these, the students I was working with. And that's one of the really important things to consider when you're doing this or trying to take on the sport ed model. I don't think it's suitable for every group of kids. There may be individuals in that, but from my experience so far, it's been to have a large cohort of kids capable of doing this is not going to come across your path very often. When I came to Beijing, I be began using this or aspects of it, keeping teams consistent throughout an entire unit and putting more responsibility on the students and creating a student centered approach to running drills or warm up aspects. Uh, specifically in my touch rugby unit, and that had to do with part of the assessment where they needed to be able to reflect on their performance with a team, and it didn't work having them change teams every lesson. They needed to be able to build relationships and understand what being part of a team meant and how to play and support their teammates' strengths and weaknesses. At this point, I'm going to ask William if there's been any questions posted that uh, he might want to throw my way? No, uh, no questions yet, but I have posed a couple of questions based on your presentation, and I've asked uh, how big their class sizes were, and most of them ranged anywhere between uh, 25, low 20s, to mid 30s. Uh, so we were kind of, as you put your screen up, allowing everybody else to answer their question. Uh, and how much time they have with their kids as well. And then the last question I asked was um, how long their units were. And are they, is there anybody who has full control of theirs that could change theirs at the drop of the hat? Has anybody mentioned that? Um, not that they have full control, uh, but uh, Rev PE did say that his district curriculum um, is dictated to him, which, uh, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I find that that's, that would be hard to do. <laughs> that's a, narrow. Good district, I guess, right? 
Um, yeah, hopefully people making good choices for you. Yeah, if not, I imagine that would be very frustrating. Um, <laughs> and so some of the folks are talking that they only have their kids for, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. Some are mm. as long as 75 minutes. So it's very interesting to see the difference in uh, the time that they have. So maybe at some point we could maybe discuss, you know, what do you do? Can you implement a sport ed in a, a 30 minute class? Well, I think there would be some scope for it. I'm happy to talk about that now too. Okay. And there are several people that say they do have control and that's good to hear. I think if you have, if you have really short classes, sort of that 30 to 45 minute window, maybe approaching it from you have your first lesson of the week, if you have multiple lessons in a week, would be drill based and not, and maybe small modified games, and then taking that and extending it into the next lesson of the week, and that becomes uh, medium sized gameplay. And when I get to the sample unit, I'll show you how I structured my that progression from coaching, student coaching to small uh, internal team games to medium size uh, in inter team games against other teams within their class. Sounds good. Well, we're ready to move on. So the reason I chose sport ed was primarily because of the IB MYP criterion D and the MYP is a criterion based assessment model and criterion D is a lot of people refer to it as our reflection criteria there's three strands and in those strands students have to focus on interpersonal skills goal setting developing strategies for success and reflection on specific roles I've always found it really challenging to find authentic opportunities to identify develop um, and reflect on the first strand. Um, the IB doesn't give us any guidelines on what interpersonal skills are. They say we have to assess them on interpersonal skills, but they don't. There's no list of what those skills would look like. Um, so I took to Twitter and started um, polling some colleagues, trying to find out what the core interpersonal skills in our subject are, and the key ones like communication and collaboration kept coming up but then started getting into some more interesting ones like conflict mediation and decision making and um, uh, basic uh, developing leadership skills as well like listening and being able to speak and provide feedback. The roles that I'll talk about were really designed with specific interpersonal skills in mind so students could focus on developing those skills in that role in the hopes that it would lead to progress and lead to some success in that role. It was necessary for students to identify specific skills at the beginning of the unit uh, and we worked together on that. Um, but it was also necessary for them to identify some basic strategies to work towards that goal. Uh, this was done through a combination of Moodle discussion forums for goal setting, ongoing reflection journals as homework, and a final written task that culminated and used the evidence from their goal setting at the beginning and their reflection journal to sort of bring together all the pieces that we worked on. Um, and I'll share that reflection, that final assessment with you a little bit later as well. So this is really the meat of the presentation. Uh, I'm going to go through the process of development. So how I built the teams, the roles and responsibilities within my unit. Uh, this is focusing very heavily on my touch rugby unit that I did from the middle of uh, the end of September till the end of October. And this was the first time I really implemented this in a full system, in a full full way of my teaching. 
We'll talk about the resources I built as well, go over some of the assessment, uh, the online resources I use. We use Moodle as a learning management platform. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It has its pros and it has its cons. Um, and then we'll share some of the coaching resources. And then the last bit is going through a sample unit, or my unit outline from Touch Rugby. It's really bare bones in this, but feel free to ask any questions about what specific aspects look like. I'm happy to clarify. So building the teams. This was something that I gave a lot of thought to. It, was, it could be very easily done with Team Shake or any number of apps or pulling names out of a hat or letting students choose their own teams. Um, I chose to give it a lot of thought and focused on these um, five key areas to try to balance the teams as effectively as possible. So my first unit of the year was fitness and it was a very individual unit but it also required students to work together to give feedback on a bunch of different tasks. So I got to see how students interacted with each other, got to see leadership abilities, how they communicate, um, who's shy, who's outgoing, who are the alphas, who are the um, students who are happy to sit back. And based on this, I started placing students. And it seems to have really worked. Um, the groups are very well balanced. Uh, one of the things I was really conscious of was behavior and friendship groups. So students will always naturally move towards their best friends. And these are not always the best really relationships for learning and trying to encourage them away from those groups is not always effective but if they're permanently placed in a group separated from those negative influences it's, it's a non-starter they don't have the option of finding a partner who's going to disrupt their learning they can focus right off the bat because they know they're not going to have that option uh, and I've noticed a lot of progress from the three or four group pairs of students that this was an issue in the first unit where even given the option to find an, their own partner they don't automatically go to their best friend anymore it's uh, and when they do they're much more focused than they were in that first unit I've also been pleasantly surprised that uh, other subjects in grade 7 are using these groups um, and finding that they work really well uh, in classroom subjects as well so in our humanities or social studies, they were grouped. Um, and in their English, they were grouped partially. And in their uh, advisory or PSE or citizenship or homeroom or whatever part of the world you come from and whatever you call it, uh, we've used these groups a, a, quite a few times. And it's nice to see that they transfer and that they're getting a, really comfortable with those um, groups. The so next Ken, part of Ken, let's, uh, oh. I do have one question from um, Eric. He's, he asked about what are some of the cons that you had uh, using Moodle? Oh, uh, <laughs> Moodle is a whole separate presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Um, it, is, it is not overly user-friendly. It's clunky. It doesn't have a great interface. It requires a lot of previous knowledge from your students in how to access things. Um, it is incredibly powerful and provides a lot of options for students, but actually setting them up and having students be able to use them is incredibly time consuming. Right. So what's, what Moodle is developed for into for most teachers at my school is very much a resource sharing and resource collection um, site. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have access to Google Classroom um, because it is blocked in China. So we don't have those kind of collaborative tools and Moodle is really our best option until something else is developed that we have access yeah, you to. You and I discussed that before is, is I use Google Classroom and love it because it is, it, it's so simple. It doesn't have as many options as Moodle, but man, it is definitely a collaborative tool that's easy for kids to use. Uh, and so, yeah, Google Classroom and all the Google products works really well. Yeah, we. Okay, uh, uh, here we go. <laughs> so he just wrote back. 
He said, um, he said, I meant with a sport ed model. My bad. Uh, so thanks, Eric, for helping us out there. Um, but we, it's good to show that, you know, because some teachers have heard of Moodle. Typically yeah. in the States, that's more of a, they uh, use that more in our colleges. Um, mm -hmm. So that was actually good that we did mention that. But he wants to know maybe, maybe some of the cons that maybe you felt when you were teaching in the UK that didn't allow you to fully implement where now that you're in China and Beijing, you're really finding some things that are, are working. Having access to this technology, even even Moodle, is makes it a lot easier to share outlines and share resources. So students aren't constantly coming back to paper resources or losing paper resources. They have a go-to place where oh, I forgot what my responsibility was as a uh, coach for this unit. Um, and they know where to go to find that information, and it's always at their fingertips. Uh, and being able to ha have that as a foundation is really easy to build on, regardless of what platform you're using. Um, that was definitely something. The When we tried to implement it in England, we were missing was that good, solid... Uh, resource bank or resource package for the kids. It was a lot more jigsaw-y piecing it together as we went and there wasn't a single place you could build and then have the students work from, if that makes sense. That's, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, technology has made all our lives a little bit easier, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, unless you're adding a lower third name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Any continue. more questions? Nope, we're good. Okay. Wow, half hour already, huh? Time's worried about not getting fun. through. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So the next step of development uh, that I had to really give a lot of thought to was roles and responsibilities. Uh, the full model, there's a huge number of them. And I wanted to really boil it down to some really key ones. Um, these were all posted on Moodle for student access and review, and I've included the descriptions as uh, docs in the shared resources, um, so feel free to have a look. So to give you an example, uh, the coach's key responsibilities are listed, and then what the students were asked to do as a homework task was to take a list of interpersonal skills that was also on Moodle and decide on the role they want and then think about which interpersonal skills were necessary to be successful in each of these and then that's how they started setting their goal was looking at what do I need to be successful in this role so as a coach do I need assertiveness do I need to be able to communicate verbally I need patience for students who might not understand or for peers who might not get the skills right away. So what are the skills that I need to be successful? And that's what I keep pushing back to the students is what do you need to focus on to be successful in your role? I'm not going to go through all of these right now. Uh, they're all here for you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to clarify. Um, or if you'd like me to go through more, just let William know and I uh, can spend some more time on these. The reason I chose these was because it was really important to ensure the students could draw explicit links between the roles responsibilities and at least one of the interpersonal skills. So the examples I've given you or referees need to ensure that they can focus on conflict resolution and mediation and coaches need to ensure that they recognize patience and respect for others as priorities in the role. I also wanted to make sure that every member of the group had a specific role with specific responsibilities. In the full model, a player is a role within that. Um, but I wanted everybody to feel like they were contributing to the team in some way. Uh, even if the roles were shared, so referees would alternate, so it wasn't always the same person not playing. Um, and you, 
there was always in the touch rugby unit one referee from each team. So it became very much a collaboration between them to be as fair officials as possible. It was also really important to consider the attitude and approach of your students when you're planning these roles uh, to ensure that they engage with at least one of them. Not all students are going to be comfortable being a coach, but if communication is a key skill that students need to work on as part of your unit, then developing that in a quiet student becomes really challenging. And it might be as simple as having a responsibility of an equipment manager talking to the coach before every session um, in a one-to-one -one role and not having to lead a bigger group helping that st quieter student develop those skills in an effective way. So one of the things that's been asked, uh, Ken, is you know when do the students uh, plan their training sessions and update the blogs and so forth? The, the way I structured it with grade 7 was I planned all the sessions um, and I'll go over that a little bit shortly. Uh, but at this age, I wanted to make sure that they were focusing on the delivery of it and focused on those skills and not having to worry about planning in a sport that some of them weren't familiar with. Um, and there was a first part to that question, too, that I completely forgot. Nope, you got it. Okay. Uh, to develop the resources, like I said, we were on Moodle, and I would have a link on Moodle to training day and today we're working on passing and receiving. So the skill, passing and receiving, the equipment was listed for the equipment manager, the name of the drill, the purpose. I tried to keep the key teaching points below five so they could keep those ideas in their head. And then I had an animated drill I created using Coach Note on my iPad. And this is definitely my biggest, I wouldn't say regret, but area for improvement the next time I do this. Um, so at the beginning of every session, I'd meet with the coaches to explain the setup and organization, and then they'd explain that to the equipment managers, or I'd meet with all of them and explain it to them. Uh, we'd review the drill and the skills. We'd dem I'd demonstrate the drill for them. They'd go through, participate in it so they understood the pattern. Uh, this was organized and as a part of a three to five minute transition between our daily fitness training and the full lesson. So while the rest of the group was transitioning out of fitness and getting water and the equipment managers were setting up, I was speaking to the coaches and uh, getting this organized so there wasn't a lot of downtime with people sitting and doing nothing. My coaches would have their laptops with them to review the resources. This was really poor planning on my part. Uh, <clears throat> doing this again, I would build this as something like an iBook and create a bank of resources with the training sessions and the videos in one place on a school iPad that the coaches could have with them. The laptops were cumbersome and really uh, stressful to have those out in a teaching area where they could easily get broken. Um, whereas the iPads are well padded and protected and a lot more user friendly in that environment. Uh, and I could easily build in some kind of video recording from the coaches as well that they could use to analyze their performance as a coach. Uh, so there's a lot of scope to develop that, but being the first time I did this, I was building these drills to suit the kids to make sure that they could perform them and coach them as effectively as possible. So at the beginning of the unit, I used one of the Moodle discussion forums as a homework piece. And the students would set their goal from home on a discussion forum and talk to other students as part of, or reply to other students' posts to give them some ideas for strategies as well uh, in their goal setting. Uh, sorry, just going through my notes. So they set the public goals on a discussion forum, uh, and again, it, this part was completed as homework. Uh, following the first lesson, students reviewed the 
roles and responsibilities to identify their preference for the unit, and they had to come ready in the second lesson to convince their team what role they should take on. And this was one of the first challenges I really posed in the unit, and it was good timing in some ways because I had parent-student-teacher conferences the week before this unit started. And with some really strong-willed students, I got the chance to talk to them and their parents about the idea that you're not always going to get what you want. And what you want might not always be best for the team. So it's another interpersonal skill to think of how am I going to benefit the team doing something I don't want to do, but I still need to be successful in that to help my team be successful. And it was really good seeing the parents engage in that conversation with their um, child, talking to them about, well, what do you want to do? And are, do you think you'd be good at that? And really helping start that conversation with them. The ongoing reflection journal focused on specific guiding questions. And that's coming up in the next slide. Um, and the last lesson in the unit was a written task um, that was a reflection using all the evidence we gathered. So the reflection journal, I let the students use any platform they wanted. They could write it in a Word document, they could do uh, podcasts, they could do any kind of recording they wanted. Um, it wasn't part of their assessment, but it was evidence they could use as part of their assessment. So the more effectively they did the journal, the more evidence they would have in that reflection task at the end of the unit. Uh, the three questions I had them focus on were what skills did you have to use in your role today? How did these skills help you in your role? And what skills do you need to focus on next lesson to be more successful? Uh, and it was good to see students using specific examples in that final assessment task. During the, I had uh, parent-student-teacher conferences last week, um, and it was really interesting to see how many of them remembered the conversation about this model and me explaining it to them and ask them asking questions about, oh, what what role did my daughter take on, and oh, were were they nice? Were they nice to other students when they were captain? And it was really interesting to see them engaged in that way because. Explaining it to them in October, a lot of parents were really surprised at how little focus there was on individual skill development and more focus on holistic student development. Um, I actually had a parent ask last week, uh, what do I do about students taking on the same role all the time and being the bossy, fish-shaking dictator of the team? And it was hilarious to watch their child turn to them and say, why would you do that? And then we got a chance to talk about how everyone has different strengths and a coach in touch rugby is unlikely to be the same person to take on the role of choreographer in our synchronized swimming unit. And yes, you heard that correctly, we do a synchronized swimming unit. Uh, it's also a great way to start the conversation with parents and students that sometimes you can't have the role you want and like I said you've got to find a way to be successful in that role regardless of you wanting to do it or not and that's a pretty valuable skill for life. Uh, so the last uh, kid, in your reflection yeah. your reflection journal is that a homework or do they do that in class? I had a question. Uh, no it's done as homework and it's done as optional homework. Optional homework, okay. So like then, I said, um, it's not Go ahead. It's not assessed, but it provides them evidence to use in their assessment. So if they choose to engage in it, then they are giving themselves evidence for that final task. If they choose to not engage in it, then that's a choice they're making and they're it's going to affect their level of achievement because they're not going to have the same level of evidence as another student. Okay. And then also, somebody asked, uh, what, I, the, what cases do you use for your iPads? Oh, uh, these ones. I have no idea. The library bought them. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think. I have some really good cases on mine, too. But, yeah, they just came with our 
they have a nice uh, cushioned yeah. corners, and yeah, they're they're nearly indestructible. Yeah, and they've got a plastic cover over the screen as well. Um, I've had them on pool deck on the pool deck, and I've had no qualms about them getting splashed or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah there are a lot of good ones out there. Yeah, I know you'll well, get to, I know you'll get to this um, here shortly, but uh, one of the questions also the most. You know, one of the big things about the Sport Edna model is the culminating event. Um, mm. and they just want to know what you do for your culminating event. But I think you can answer that here shortly, right? Uh, yeah, I talk about it briefly when I compare my changes to the full model. Um, but for people who are wondering, the full model is very much grounded in the idea of a celebratory festival at the end of the season. And what I'm I haven't developed that into mine ours is very much when you come to the end of the season we have assessment tasks we need to do whether they're performance or whether they're written and it's still celebratory but not necessarily fun party celebratory um, so we do uh, touch rugby unit ended with three lessons of tournament gameplay of extended tournament gameplay with giving teams lots of chance to talk to each other and reflect on their performance and then go back and try to work on specific things. Uh, and the synchronized swimming unit ended with them doing their performances uh, and the badminton unit we just finished ended with them doing their assess tournament. Very good. So I'll just jump back to the presentation. And completely ruin it. <laughs> so I've talked about all this stuff already. Um, the discussion forum at the beginning of the unit, these were the just to get them writing something to set a goal. So state the role you think you'd be most successful at in this unit. Identify the interpersonal skills necessary to be successful and describe a strategy you will follow to achieve your goal. Uh, all of my students set this. I would really like to figure out a way to get them to engage with each other more on that discussion forum end where they're actually helping support each other and give each other ideas to extend and review their goal. So I, it may be turning that into an, um, setting the goal in class and using that homework time to specifically reply to a, a couple of peers with uh, some structured responses. And again, this was just the journal with the guiding questions. And this was done as homework uh, over the entire unit, starting from the second lesson right through till the final lesson of the assess tournament. So the final written reflection, students were given 45 minutes to do this. We did our daily workout, and then the rest, uh, the remainder of the lesson was done for this. Um, I'm not a huge fan of taking time away from activity to completing activities like this, but it's a necessity in the MYP model um, and to complete our assessments. Uh, we don't off I'm sounding very defensive right now. We don't often take huge chunks of time. My assessments usually last 20 to 30 minutes, but because of the amount of time I'd given in the lead up to this, I wanted to make sure that the students had significant time to share their learning. Um, so you can just review, you can have a look at the questions and the tasks there. Uh, does anybody have a question about how this was done or um, how it was assessed or any of those things? Uh, I have another version of this that our English language learners and our learning support students use that's a lot more scaffolded. Um, and they're provided with extra time in support classes as well.
if you have any questions about that, feel free to send me a note on Twitter or email, and I'm happy to talk through any of those tasks with you. The coaching drills, there's a link here um, to the videos I made on Coach Note. Uh, just a couple of notes on these. Uh, I will redo all of them. They were not <laughs> they were not good. They were effective in sharing with the kids, but I needed to refine them a lot more. Um, what I tried to do in the drill development was keep them as consistent as possible with organization. So they do two or three lessons of the same setup of drill, but changing the skill focus or uh, refining a skill. Uh, and then change the setup and keep that same setup for a couple of lessons so that the coaches weren't learning an entirely new setup every single lesson. They could, and the equipment managers could set it up a lot quicker as well. Um, and I found this, that part really, really worked because they remembered the setup, everybody in the groups remembered the patterns they had to use, and it really helped them get going a lot quicker. Um, and it was just that introductory lesson with a new pattern where they're asking what do we do, where do we go, uh, who do I pass to, and the coaches were very patient. I was all pleasantly surprised with that. Do you find Coach Note uh, simple to use? Is it user friendly for you? Yes, Coach Note is a fantastic app. Um, I use it and my, I do an ultimate frisbee unit at the end of the year where the students design and lead a drill um, on one of the foundation skills in ultimate frisbee and part of their assessment is animating their drill on Coach Note. Um, and the students can do it having never used Coach Note before pretty effectively. So I safely say it's very user-friendly. Great. And then, so you've got uh, all these reflections. Um, uh, they're blowing up now. Um, <laughs> How do you find the time to score all the reflections in your criterion, um, D? Okay. And how many times a year do you assess your students in this way? Oh, uh, <laughs> our school says we have to assess all students in all criteria four times a year, but not all criteria in the same unit. So in touch rugby, the only criteria I assessed was, was C, which is performance, and D, which was that reflection task. Uh, whereas fitness, which was my very first unit, I did all four. So this at the beginning of the year, the students can see all of the assessment criteria. They can get used to how those assessments work. Um, but then for badminton, which we just finished, I only do performance. For swimming, we only do planning, which is criteria B and uh, criteria C for stroke assessment. Um, and in, we're doing capoeira starting next week, and that's a criterion A or knowledge assessment, and that'll be a written one at the end of the unit and another performance assessment. Great. So it's different for every school. It's different. Uh, the MYP actually says you only need to assess each criteria two times a year, um, but our school says four. So as we're starting to uh, head this to a close, obviously this is not something that you can uh, start Monday morning. No. Uh, so what would you suggest someone who's really interested in this? I know I noticed you mentioned the book. What would their what mm -hmm. steps could they take? And I know we've got uh, we're getting ready to send out a Tazel comment that they share the Twitter handles. There's a lot of great folks out there using Sport Ed Model. Um, mm. They can contact you. They've got the book. What would, what would you be your recommendation for the first couple steps? Uh, just let me go back because it's actually my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> so getting started, like, like you said, this is not something that you can turn around on a Monday on Monday this week and start. Um, the three things I think you really need to give the most thought to is the purpose. Uh, why are you doing this? Is there a specific reason? For me it was to give the students a 
really authentic opportunity to work on those interpersonal skills. Um, and then I've developed from there into other units. Uh, but really have a clear purpose behind it and be able to articulate that to parents in a way that they understand it. Um, for those of you working in a standards-based model, I know some of you, uh, like using the shape standards, uh, looking at standards 2, 4, and 5 are the ones that jumped out at me where there's really good links to sport ed ideas. Um, and if you're looking for a place to start, it's probably your standards to see where this model fits in best. Uh, looking at the time available, uh, this is not something you could effectively do with only like four lessons. You need eights pushing it. I'm finding that to be too short. I'm finding 12 to be just right for the way I've structured it. Uh, my ultimate frisbee unit is going to be longer. I think it's about 14 to 16 lessons. So it's going to be interesting to see how the students respond to it being a little bit longer and having more time to develop that. And the last bit is having a clear sense of organization. So the things I talked about, roles and responsibilities especially, know what your students' strengths are and understand how they will get the most out of this model. Um, and then thinking about how you're going to share resources. There's a lot of front loading necessary to, for this to be successful. And it's definitely not something where you can throw resources together the day of and hope the students understand them. Uh, you really need to give it some thought and careful reflection and then be really willing to let things fail completely because you might give students a drill that makes a lot of sense in your head uh, but that they just don't get um, and that's not going to be their fault. Um, they just don't have the skills to communicate it yet. Uh, so yeah. looking to go at a lower level than you would expect I think. Yeah, I think you, you definitely hit the nail on the head with the three things to consider. You know, as best practice for all teachers, we should ask why we're doing things. You know, is it good for kids? Um, I really like the fact that, you know, I, I'm trying to advocate here in the, in, at least in my realm of influence, of expanding their units. A lot of people, um, they, they do a lot of units in a really short period of time. And I think this is my personal opinion, and just based on the research that I've looked at and, and experienced myself, longer units actually help the kids. Um, Usually, less yep. is more to yep. where the kids, especially the lower level kids, really at, actually have a chance to succeed and learn a skill. Um, and then you're right, the organization, there is a lot of front loading to really any good teaching. And yep. with that, it allows you to be able to be a better facilitator of your uh, your curriculum and your content instead of constantly trying to you know put out fires behaviors and so forth uh, and you're yep. really able to to teach and so I, I think you really hit those points that I hope that everybody's paying attention to no matter what model they're using um, yeah but today talking about the sport ed model I Ken our time is um, is up Man. and I didn't last one get to share. Yeah, sorry folks. I didn't get to share the sample unit with you, so please go through the presentation. It's there. Um, and I'm just realizing my screen's not shared, so you can't see anything. Um, the sample unit is all shared and broken down. Uh, so you can see how I structured my touch rugby unit. If you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, Twitter and email are probably the best options. <clears throat> um, and if you're not on Twitter, why not? There you go. All right. Well, Ken, I definitely appreciate uh, you taking your time out to share your learning experience. Uh, I, I really appreciate your transparency and, and how you began uh, using the Sport Ed model, that it didn't go as well, and that you know, years later, you've you've come back to it and you've made it better because you're a better teacher. You have a better perspective. But I definitely appreciate that because you know, learning is is for everybody. And teachers definitely, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got to get out of our comfort zones and really, hopefully, continue to grow as teachers 
to help our students. And I think you really um, showed that throughout your presentation today. And uh, I hope that everybody will check out the resources. And we have another session coming up for those that are uh, still on the Phys Ed Summit. So again, Ken, thank you. Uh, for everybody else that's out there, thank you on TOSL. And hope that the learning will continue. Thanks, folks. Good morning, Appreciate good night, it. and good afternoon.